I'd like to talk about who we're running against. A billionaire who calls women fat broads and horse-faced lesbians. And no, I'm not talking about Donald Trump. I'm talking about Mayor Bloomberg. This is the story of Michael Bloomberg. Who is Michael Bloomberg? You see, I actually know Michael a little bit. Michael Bloomberg is the ninth richest man in the world. Michael Bloomberg ran for president of the United States. I'm the only one here that I think has ever started a business. Is that fair? He was born here in Boston, Massachusetts and grew up here. Michael Bloomberg's net worth is over $61 billion. That's a six with 10 zeros after it. Michael is 5'8 and Jewish. That's here on the median height distribution of American males. Michael Bloomberg is the founder of Bloomberg LP, a financial information and software company that provides something called the terminal to investment bankers. He also started a global news network called Bloomberg News. I'm Emily Chang. This is Bloomberg Technology from San Francisco. I am a very rich. Michael Bloomberg was the mayor of New York City for 12 years after 9-11. The public wants their leaders from both parties. And Michael Bloomberg was my former employer. Yes, I used to work for Bloomberg News. That's the view from the 21st floor of his headquarters. Let's start at the beginning. Michael Rubens Bloomberg was born on February 14th, 1942, blah, blah, blah. He was a kid, he went to school, his family was fine. Let's skip through all the boring parts and pick up where it matters. Like, how did he get so rich? His first job after college was Solomon Brothers in New York City. It was a lame job, but it's here where his life really begins, when he got promoted to a bond trader. From then on, Michael began to focus on equity trading and later systems development at Solomon Brothers. Indeed, it was the CEO, Billy Solomon, who asked Michael to leave his prestigious sales position and focus on the emerging computer systems area. This would begin his curiosity in the commodification of financial information and the rise of computers to deliver and analyze market information instantaneously. Although not rich, Michael had found moderate success. In 1975, Michael married Susan Elizabeth Brown, a British national. Mike had met Susan a few years earlier while she was temping for Solomon Brothers on a work visa. Four years later, they would celebrate their first child together, Emma, and then later Georgina. However, things weren't always great in the family. Michael was often removed and focused on work. This is Julius. It's a little crazy sometimes, but you know, <laughs> we like him anyway. Having the last name Bloomberg sucks. <laughs> I, mean, I remember when won a big class in May um, at a horse show, and a few in, a few people from different magazines wanted to interview me. You know, it doesn't really matter to me what the hell they think. During the 1970s, the Bloomberg family was doing well. But in 1981, at the age of 39, disaster struck Mike. Bloomberg was laid off at Solomon Brothers. The company he had worked for for 15 years fired him. Solomon Brothers was undergoing an acquisition, and Bloomberg was let go. It was only because of his partner position that he received a $10 million cash buyout for his stake at the firm. Even Warren Buffett was dragged into the quagmire of Solomon Brothers during this era. I would like to start by apologizing for the acts that have brought us here. The nation has a right to expect its rules and laws to be obeyed. And at Solomon, certain of these were broken. Lose money for the firm and I will be understanding. Lose a shred of reputation for the firm and I will be ruthless. $10 million is a lot, but he had a family of four to provide for and no job prospects. So Bloomberg once again tried something new. This time, he would work for himself. $10 million he was paid would become the seed money for Michael's own data service company called IMS, or Innovative Market Systems. IMS was formed on Michael's belief that Wall Street would pay a premium for high quality business information delivered instantaneously on computers in a consumer friendly format. At the time, a very novel idea, but he was quick to put his money to work and rented a 10 by 10 foot studio. He began to make computers that would deliver real-time market data to customers via a landline connection and hired programmers to write software. At first, his machines were called Market Master Terminals, but it wasn't easy. The Market Master Terminals were not popular. Nobody wanted to buy one. With the computer age, each investment bank was already working on their own software. Why would they buy his? It wasn't until two full years later in 1983 that Michael landed his first customer, Merrill Lynch. 
Merrill Lynch believed in Michael's vision of hyper-fast market data and decided to invest an additional $30 million into IMS to finance the development of his Market Master computer. It was a success, and by 1984, IMS began selling its computer system, now known simply as the Bloomberg Terminal, to other Wall Street banks. I owe Merrill Lynch a great debt. In 1981, when we began this company, I went to every house on the street to try to get them to buy our system. At that time, everyone was too busy building their own in-house stuff to take interest. But Merrill Lynch said, we have our own project going, but in case it doesn't work out, we'll take 20 of your terminals. It was that initial order for 20 terminals that started this company. Michael Bloomberg, 1989. By 1990, Michael Bloomberg had renamed IMS to Bloomberg LP and had over 8,000 paying clients for his computer terminals. But Michael was financially savvy. He didn't just sell software like Microsoft or a computer like Dell. Instead, Michael was an early pioneer of the subscription service. Customers had to pay an annual fee to access a personal Bloomberg terminal, and Bloomberg made sure those fees weren't cheap. After all, if one bank had the terminal, Michael knew other banks were forced to get them as well. Otherwise, the competition would have an edge. Man riding a bicycle is twice as good as the Condor, and that's really exactly what we feel we're doing. We're really blazing the trails for the 21st century bicycle. When I started the company, it was before PCs were invented. I know you don't think there was a day. We literally built our own, and the internet hadn't been invented, so we created our own. We'd rent a telephone line and then had a little device that let you branch out when you got to Chicago or wherever. In 1998... <laughs> Customers paid $1,500 a month to have a Bloomberg terminal on their desk. This allowed Bloomberg to grow rapidly. Banks and brokers started purchasing terminals in succession quickly, and almost overnight, Bloomberg LP became cash positive and highly liquid. But there's more. Bloomberg's growing customer base with the subscription model can be relied upon for continual demand. All right, so this is what the terminal looks like. Kind of imposing, right? But it can do a lot of fancy things, include instant message anyone else who has a terminal, like Jamie Dimon, here's his phone number. The terminal also has a secret Craigslist of sorts. Let's see, a Rolex. Just 9,000 pounds. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Mike's next move with Bloomberg LP was to launch Bloomberg News, a 24-hour global financial news network, along with Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Message. In 1990, Bloomberg News launched exclusively for terminal owners, but Mike and editor-in-chief Max Winkler quickly expanded it into a full-blown cable channel. Mike wanted to end his company's reliance on the Dow Jones News Service, Bloomberg's biggest competitor, also known as the Wall Street Journal. But Mike's news arm served a multi-purpose. While it helped break news and offered allegedly unbiased financial information to markets outside the United States, it also helped establish the Bloomberg brand globally and continues to act as a marketing tool to sell more terminals around the world. Now here's where my colleagues might not like what I'm saying. My former colleagues test that they practice real journalism. I don't disagree, but I believe that the ultimate utility of Bloomberg News is not breaking stories like the New York Times, but to act as a large, subtle advertising agency to create brand authority and open new customer bases. After all, Bloomberg News operates at a loss, but this is offset by the ability to sell even more expensive terminals to new customers around the world. In reality, Bloomberg News and the Bloomberg Terminal act in a symbiotic relationship, each increasing the value of the other. Bloomberg News. In 2014, there were published reports that Bloomberg News killed a story about Chinese leader Xi Jinping about his wealth, quoting, the company should have reconsidered articles that deviated from its core of coverage of business news because they jeopardized the huge, huge sales potential for its products in the Chinese market. Nevertheless, despite bowing to China, the growth of Bloomberg terminals and the launch of Bloomberg News in the 1990s, everything looked swell for Michael. On the outside, things looked nothing but up for Bloomberg LP. But then, in 1993, Susan filed for divorce. Michael's marriage was crumbling. Luckily, the divorce was amiable, and Susan and Michael remain friends to this day. Despite the decline in his marriage, Mike's company continued to grow. As of 2015, Bloomberg has over 325,000 terminal subscribers, each paying around $24,000 to $20,000 a year. That's $7.8 billion in revenue annually, and Mike continues to retain 88% of the company. Having never taken it public, it remains under his total control.
Okay, so coming up is the entrance to the Bloomberg building. The entire skyscraper is his. Business that successful allows it to have a koi fish pond in the building, like this. In fact, there are 20 koi fish in this building to symbolize the first 20 terminals bought by Merrill Lynch. Massive. Ooh, a Rice Krispie Treat. I am, a, I am an honest man. Is there something you'd like to say? Welcome to the Bloomberg office. Where else have you seen a curved escalator? We needed a curved one. It fit into the space, and the architect said it doesn't exist. And I said, you go to Japan, you'll find a curved one. And they did, of course. But Bloomberg LP also has some business quirks courtesy of Mike. Every employee is graded on a five point scale quarterly and rigorous notes are kept by your boss weekly regarding everything you said or did. Yes, it sounds Orwellian. Bloomberg also has the unusual policy of refusing to ever rehire anyone who leaves the company. Though I personally know this rule has been broken a few times. But vast wealth wouldn't be Michael's only goal in life. In 2001, Michael would officially enter politics. Mike decided to run for mayor of New York City as a Republican in the 2001 race. Most people at 59 would be content with having built a business empire that spans the globe. Yet strange as it seems, Michael Bloomberg's ambition now is the top job at City Hall. That's the best you can do? You can do that. It was an aggressive, contentious campaign. Mark, you have a right to your own opinions, but not a right to your own facts. But Mike won, and in 2002, he resigned his position as CEO at Bloomberg and moved into the mayor's office. But again, it was not easy. As mayor, Mike initially struggled with approval ratings as low as 24%. Less than one out of five New Yorkers liked him early on. However, Bloomberg's mayorship became known in New York City for several big issues, and he subsequently developed and maintained high approval ratings. For example, Mike chose to apply a statistical metrics-based management approach to the city and granted department commissioners broad autonomy in their decision making. Michael also raised taxes in New York City and declined to accept a salary as mayor, instead simply drawing $1 a year. But perhaps his most famous legacy as mayor, and controversial, is the New York City soda ban. Now to the looming ban this morning on all supersized sugary drinks. New York City planning to outlaw sales of big sodas and other sweet drinks I'm just kidding, it was the Stop and Frisk program. Stop and Frisk, while initially put in action by Mike's predecessor, was elevated and vastly expanded under him. Police stops increased sixfold under Michael's tenure. Thousands stopped on the streets of New York because they look or act a certain way. Michael Bloomberg is even quoted as saying, Put those cops where the crime is between minority neighborhoods. The way you get the guns out of the streets of is uh, to throw them against the wall. Some say crime dramatically increased in New York City under Mike, but a trend of lower crime had already begun before Mike took office, and the cause remains inconclusive. Instead, what is fact is that the U.S. federal court eventually struck down stop and frisk as unconstitutional and a form of racial profiling illegal in the United States. But in 2005, it was time for Bloomberg to run for re-election again. This time, he spent $85 million on his campaign, more than any other candidate in history, and won. Well, I think everybody does know what my opponent stands for. He stands for complaining. He stands for identifying problems and never coming up with solutions. It's easy to be a critic. It is very hard to lead. Bloomberg's political stances are varied and controversial. Michael Bloomberg's passionate about gun control and remains a large donor towards organizations and other candidates that help gun control legislation pass. Michael Bloomberg is also a believer in man-made climate change, stating in 2008 his endorsement of Barack Obama was for precisely this issue. Michael's mayorship was one of pro-choice, same-sex marriage, and granting citizenship to illegal immigrants. But Michael would continue to run for a controversial third term in 2009. November 3rd, vote Mike Bloomberg. Let's re On October 2nd, 2008, Michael announced he would seek to extend the city's term limit laws and run for a third mayoral term. Mike argued a leader of his field was needed following the financial crisis of 2008. This financial crisis, while strengthening essential services such as education and public safety, is a challenge I want to take on. So should the city council vote to amend term limits? 
The city's term limit was extended, and he was once again selected again. Michael Bloomberg has been elected to a third term as mayor of New York City. Eventually not leaving the mayor's office until 2013. After 12 long years, Michael resumed working at his company. However, this time he began to focus more on philanthropy. Nearly all profits from Bloomberg LP go to Bloomberg Philanthropies, which is dedicated to saving and improving lives around the world. In 2010, Michael signed the Giving Pledge, which, along with Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, means he agrees to give away more than 50% of his wealth. Since then, Michael has donated over $3.3 billion to his alma mater, John Hopkins. This created the unique opportunity for anyone who now gets accepted to attend free due to his donations. And in 2016, Following President Trump's announcement that the U.S. government would pull out of the Paris Climate Accord, Bloomberg outlined a coalition of cities, states, and universities that had come together to honor America's commitment under the agreement. Private philanthropy is a very American tradition, and uh, it's one of the things that I think lets America hold its head up uh, and sort of uh, say we're better than everybody else. I really believe that. Now, in 2020, Michael has entered the presidential race. This morning, Michael Bloomberg is making it official. Now to the Democratic presidential field growing larger this morning as former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg makes it official. We got Mini Mike. Mini Mike. I know him well. Fox News alert breaking at this moment. Michael Bloomberg has officially suspended his presidential campaign. Mike Bloomberg is ending his presidential campaign. His campaign lasted only a few months, but it spent over $500 million on advertising. It is the most expensive campaign in American history by a wide margin. American consumers will acknowledge their airwaves have been flooded with his ads. Michael says he is willing to spend up to $2 billion, too, of his own money for the Democrats in the 2020 election. So who is Michael Bloomberg? Michael is a complex and powerful person. He's rich beyond most people's wildest dreams, but is a self-made billionaire in every honest sense of the American phrase. He ran a successful mayorship of New York City, but left a legacy of controversy and unconstitutional practices. His company has had four allegations of sexual misconduct from women, but he has spent more money in the last two years electing more women to office than anyone else in history. But most of all, Michael Bloomberg might just be the man I used to invoice. Thanks for the money, Mike.